Well, it's been a while since we've done that. Yeah, feels good though, right? <laughs> you jumped back into it real nicely. It well, I think we all did. Everybody did a good countdown. It's like riding a bike. <laughs> <laughs> you never forget how to count down from five. Yeah, some things stick with you. So, Ben, yeah. we're here with another episode of The Monster Market, but this is a special episode. Every episode is a special Every episode is special, this is a but this, is, special episode. this one's one I've been waiting for. I think for a couple of reasons, yeah. right? Yeah, actually, yeah. So share with the class. Oh, uh, well, I, I, I'm particularly fond of the subject that we've picked this time, um, but I'm also uh, particularly fond of our special guest. Oh. We do have a special guest. We do. Special guest, who are you? Well, I feel celebrated. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. And, you know, it's it's a kind of almost a little weird to think of you as a special guest just because the three of us have done <laughs> we've so done a, much together. We've done a lot of podcasting together. The three of us as like a team. So it's not, it doesn't, you're right. It doesn't. <laughs> this just feels really great. It doesn't feel like a guest situation at all, really. <laughs> yeah. Our fates have been intertwined for some time, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's what's nice is that it has been a really long time since the three of us have actually recorded a conversation. That's true. Uh, between the three of us. So so it is special. It is special in that in that regard. So Jersey, yeah, we we wanted you to come on and, and be a special guest. Uh, for our monster market here, and I don't remember how we arrived at this topic that we're. I was just gonna. Today. I was just gonna actually ask you for a reminder of that because I don't remember why we why we were like, oh, the this special topic is the one. If my memory serves, we had told Jersey that we wanted him to join us for an episode. Yeah. And then asked him, I'm talking about, I'm talking about him like he's not here, mm -hmm. uh, asked him what his favorite or what a type of monster he would like to talk about okay. is. And I seem to remember you, Jersey, talking about heap monsters, like mm. uh, Swamp Thing and things like that. Yeah. And then I think after we circled around to it, I feel like there was sort of like a, that maybe that wasn't really I think what? Yeah, but I think when that was said, we, we were like, oh, that's that's a good one. Mm. Yeah, and I think that that's maybe one that we can cover, but that's actually not what we're covering today. <laughs> not not really. <laughs> so in other words, I said, this is my favorite kind of monster, and you both went, eh, nah. <laughs> we were like, well, we're going to do what we're going to do anyway. Well, okay, but to be fair, I feel like when we circled back and said heat monsters, that you were sort of like, I don't remember saying that. Ooh, it's back on you now, Jersey. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, is it starting already? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be at the cartoonist's home mm -hmm. just arguing about these things. I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I specifically remember. Say? I specifically remember you saying that. <laughs> Did you say we're all going to be at the cartoonist's home together? Yes. <laughs> like bashing each other so, with our canes. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, I mean, it, it's entirely possible I said it, and I, and I probably followed up with, oh, actually, I can only think of like two that I really like. And mm. one would be the trash heap from Fraggle Rock, and the other one would be this weird swamp monster from Dr. Otto and the Riddle of the Gloom Beam, mm. which I was ready to go rewatch in order to brush up on it. But instead, you changed it. Somehow, it in a game of telephone... It turned into what did you call it? Is that construct monsters? Um, well, Ben, I think you were what? Do you, what were you calling it, Ben? You were calling it like junk monsters. Yeah, junk monsters was I, what I liked. Like things made of inanimate material brought to life. Mm. That's basically the, that's basically kind of the the broad theme that we settled on was inanimate um, material brought to some kind of form in life you know it's 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 sort of like we're doing inorganic heap monsters or or right. heap monsters that that uh have been created through uh some sort of intelligence mm. right mm. and i think originally we were thinking like like you know there are a lot of things like gelatinous cubes and i think that the like the gelatinous cube and the trash heap from fraggle rock actually do share a little bit of weird dna and i love that kind of creature and i don't know where swamp thing fits in but i love i, I like 
that too. But and that might fit into this. I don't know. What do you? Oh, sorry. What do you think? Um, I think we should get right into it and talk about <laughs> what uh, and and actually discuss the creatures that <laughs> stop the preamble that we picked. Okay. Rather than dance right. around, we yes. should we stop dancing around the subject and just get right into it. Constructs. 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 So here's the thing. Now, normally, normally we uh, we flip a coin to see who gets to choose who goes first. But there's three of us, so that's not going to work this time. Nope, we're going to have to use a three-sided die. Well, I have a six-sided die. Mm, we'll divide by two. All prepared. Mm. And so I figured I could roll it, and we'll just say that... Jersey is one and two. Oh. Ben is three and four. And Zach is five and six. Oh. So I'll roll it. Whatever number comes up, that person gets to choose who goes first. Okay. Are you feeling that this is needlessly complicated? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you agreed to do this with me. So you knew it was going to become needlessly complicated. I know. I'm laughing with joy. I'm not laughing, making fun of you. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm like that. Roll. That's our Zach. I'm rolling it. I'm rolling the die. It's a one. So that means I get to choose. It means you get to choose. You can go first, or you can choose who goes first. I want to hear from Ben. Ooh, wow. All right. Okay. Okay. That's somehow I didn't. Wow. Okay. I guess I'm ready. Okay. Let me write some notes down here. Um, that was exactly the reaction I wanted. <laughs> ben, did you often do your homework right before class? <laughs> well, like, no, it was the same situation. You're praying for somebody else to be called on so that you can finish uh, oh, yeah. while they're going. <laughs> You're finishing your book report because you couldn't possibly be the first one up, you know? Anyway, uh, my mm -hmm. first uh, creature is the Golem of Prague. And mm. yes, the Golem of Prague. And here's here's what I love. Okay, so the Golem of Prague is something that I feel like came into my awareness, oh, gosh, a, a year or so ago. You know when you're having those moments where um, you're suddenly aware of something? It's the same thing with, you know, oh, if you, you, you get a green car, you suddenly notice all the green cars, right? Or you learn a new word and suddenly you hear that word. You're aware of it. But somehow I became aware of the Golem of Prague and I started... Um, just noticing it in my reading, the, the several books, not several, but more than one thing I was reading or media I was taking in made mention of the Golem of Prague. And I remember at some point after I was aware of, of it, I, I really got inspired by this creature when I was reading um, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. And uh, it's, a, it's about these, these two boys and they, they sneak out of Prague. This is towards the beginning, so I don't think it's too much of a spoiler. Anyway, the Golem of Prague comes into, into this story of, um, oh, 20th century or, or early American uh, or, um, story. And, and, and so I was like, wow, this, this is really great. And I started like learning more about it. So the Golem is a creature from Jewish folklore. It is made of mud and clay some kind of inanimate material, some kind of moldable inanimate material. Um, apparently in the Psalms, uh, the word golem is, and this is uh, G-O-L-E-M, which sounds so similar to our, our friend Golem under the mountain. Um, but this is the golem. Apparently in the Psalms, golem just sort of means goop or un specifically like unfinished form right so it can also hmm. yeah it can also refer to like sort sort of like spiritually unfinished in a way right like people can refer to that you can, you can refer to yourself in that way um but in 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 the legends in the stories it is brought to life you can create this golem you can create it out of clay goop mud the things of the earth shape it into a form and it is brought to life I, I just love this it's brought to life by one of the names of god one of the words of life mm. uh so i think in, in most stories that would be yahweh right and it's written 
uh, in a scroll, little little tiny scroll, written one of the, these words, and it's either placed in the head, or I think in the little like you can get little you can get little um, if you <laughs> spoilers if I think if you go to Prague I think in that neighborhood you probably get like golem tchotchkes still right and and in that in that version like it'd be like the word pressed into the the clay of the head um, we should go. But you could also put it into the, the the creature's mouth, right? And then it be, and then this this brings it to life, and then it's it's sort of like this huge, um, like powerful, like sort of like a Hulk kind of creature, right? Like this big, powerful brick creature. Um, and in the the original legend, like, um, well, actually, I want to I want to backtrack a minute because of why I like so much this idea of. It wraps a lot of a lot of my own um, sort of uh, like like spiritual path, like you know, like my religious upbringing. Like it, like it links to Catholicism, like in, in in some in some interesting ways. While I was reading about it, I was like, oh, there's all these weird little connections because you're it's it's very much ingrained in you know like um, Adam being created, like men, like the mankind being created out of, out of the goop of the earth, right? Yeah. This idea of like so when we do Ash Wednesday. You know, like the bishop will take ashes and mark them on your forehead, and this and say like, "Remember, you are dust, and to dust you will return." Mm-hmm. Which is basically the same thing that happens to the golem in this legend. It's brought to life, right? And then, like, when that word is taken away, it can like crumble back into dust. But then, the most I think the the most famous, apparently the most famous golem legend is the is the golem of Prague. So in Prague, in the 16th century. Uh, ra- this rabbi Judah Low, uh, like apparently the the Holy Roman Emperor is I don't know attacking, trying to burn down, trying to uh, expel uh, the Jewish quarter, like right the Jewish neighborhood is under attack from basically everybody else, and this rabbi creates the golem to defend the Jewish quarter from from these anti-Semitic attacks. And and it works, and you know he's he defends everything, and there's all sorts of different versions of the story. And, well, a version he's called uh, Joseph, which I think is is actually very is a very sweet <laughs> name for a golem, Joseph. Joe Golem. Yeah, Joseph Golem. He um, <laughs> but then there's some, and there's oh, in some parts of the legend he he actually he takes the word out of mouth or off the forehead. He deactivates it on Friday evening. So that the golem itself won't be working on the Sabbath, which I also think is mm. just lovely. And then in some versions, it gets out of control. He goes on a rampage, and he has to deactivate, like to basically save everybody from the golem's destructive, destructive nature. And in that version, so I, I really love all it, like the, the the sort of alchemy of all of this. Like um, so anyway, in the version where he gets out of control, it, his body uh, falls falls to the ground in some version it crumbles in some versions together but either way it's stored they take it and they put it in the attic of Prague's oldest synagogue um, which I think is called the old new synagogue I forget what it was called um, and then so but but it's still there There's, the synagogue building is still there and so you know in theory the golem is still in the attic of the synagogue in Prague which I think is wonderful, and I think that city is like with the like it's a city of magic already with that astrological cro- uh, clock and and this long history of like alchemy and all this stuff. I, ju- I just love the whole idea of it. I love the whole idea of like walking around those, like someday walking around those streets and thinking like, yeah, the golem is, is it's up there, and maybe it'll come back someday. Anyway, that that is the golem of Prague, but. Uh, there is a postscript to this, which which really cemented why I love the Golem so much. Is that uh, at some point I mentioned this to Zach, and he said, "Well, have you seen Der Golem?" And I said, "Have I seen <laughs> Have I seen Der what?" Um, and Zach, <laughs> I probably did. I probably well, probably wasn't that cool. I probably didn't think that quickly to say Der what, but. Um, Zach introduced me to the 1920 film Der Golem, Ger- German expressionist, black and white, silent film, Der Golem and How He Came to Be, which is a version of this story. And 
you can find it on you you can find some good quality uh files of it or whatever on youtube and it is it is fantastic i like i was immediately just completely taken with this it's like i said it's a version of the story it's full on german expression and there's no there's not a single there's a lot of pointiness to it and not a single straight line and it's 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 like a grim's fair it's like like the feeling that you get in a really weird Grimm's fairy tale brought to life. I cannot recommend Der Gollum highly enough. And as Zach likes to remind me, it is one of a trilogy of Gollum films, except... Yeah, it's actually the third. The third, except, right. This yeah. is like, this is like, it's like, yeah, it's like a prequel. It's a prequel to the Gollum films. But the other Gollum films... It totally films, is a prequel, yeah. Yeah, but the, is the prequel is all we have. The other two films are lost to history. And to me, that yeah, like so many of those old, well, it's, it's, you know, silent movies yeah. and stuff, yeah. And it, and it, and it, the 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 masterful art of of film being present that early makes me kind of not kind of but very very sad for the loss of the other two. Except that it, it's like the books in Alexandria. You wonder what would history be like if we had this or that little thing still with us, mm, right? right. Um, that is the goal. I have a question for you. Go for it. In in the original story, because um, I've only seen the movie, in the original story, is the golem sentient? Because he's pretty sentient in the movie, you know? Like, he yeah. uh, he obeys the rabbi, but also, like, you know, there's that scene where the rabbi's going to shut him off and the golem doesn't want him yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's pretty common. And there's, even, there's a version where he, like, falls in love, I think. And, uh, mm. and they're like... And gets like destructive when I think when people tell him like, oh, no, you can't be in love with that lady or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. But there, there so there's a like there's a, like there's a, what I'm saying is there's a, <laughs> there's a version where he, there's definitely versions where he has feelings. And um, and I think that's part of the getting out of control. So and, and it's also like there's something I was reading about it where it was like in di- it's been Gollum story. Like I'm just focusing on the Gollum of Prague, which is a Gollum story. But like, there was one thing that pointed out. Like, it's been used to represent all kinds, so many different kinds of things. That the Gollum story itself is, you know, malleable. Like the clay that the Gollum is made from. All right, uh, Jersey. With your permission, I would. I would like to go next. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> You just got to choose who goes first. It's not you're not the king of the podcast all of a sudden, Jersey. I know, I, I'm, <laughs> but I'm, I'm loving this deference. It, it feels very unusual for me. Well, okay, but so partially why I want to go next is because I think one of mine uh, kind of relates to the golem, and I and I hadn't really even put it put it together. Uh, so one of mine is sort of he's a construct, but I feel like he is construct. He might be construct adjacent um and that is frankenstein's monster or frankenstein's creature or just frankenstein so i mean you know i know there's always the um actually he's not frankenstein he's frankenstein's monster and i'm done with that conversation like i get it you're very clever you're very intelligent yes i know die hard is a christmas movie i know um but the bottom line is we all know him as Frankenstein at this point, right? So Frankenstein. Um, but what I specifically want to talk about is the original Frankenstein from the book. So uh, so first, before I get into that, um, you know, Frankenstein is iconic. You know, we all know what he looks like. He's a tall, broad, uh, green skin black hair kind of with like a flat top uh bolts out of his neck and he kind of shambles along and he grunts he doesn't really talk um and he's afraid of fire right did i i don't know did i miss anything and he's a he's a they copied him from herman munster (laughs) (laughs) and and the best version of him is in monster squad (laughs) yes right (laughs) All, all that all of that is true yes if you've heard that it's true um (laughs) but that version of frankenstein comes from really comes from the 1931 universal movie frankenstein uh 
with Boris Karloff playing mm. the monster. And he's quite a bit different, actually, from the book's version, even though that is, like I said, has become the iconic version of Frankenstein. Just really quick. So the book was actually written in 1818 by Mary Shelley. She was only 19 when she wrote this book, uh, wow. which I think is remarkably interesting. Also, given that uh, her being a young woman in 1818 wrote this novel and she's largely considered one of the first science fiction writers. I mean, 1818, I looked it up. That's 10 years before Jules Verne was even born. He was born in 1828. Wow. So, yeah. So, I mean, this really is, I would absolutely say, an early science fiction horror story uh, written by a young woman so, so long ago. The title of the book is actually Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. And I think that that subtitle really sets up what the story ultimately is about mm. and the way that Frankenstein is handled in the book. Frankenstein is created by, of course, Victor Frankenstein, who believes that he can reanimate dead tissue. He doesn't work in sort of like a secret, he doesn't work in a castle laboratory. He works in a secret lab that's in the attic of a boarding house. So he's just this like weird dude, I imagine with, with roommates and things like that. Yeah. Um, I actually sort of, if... Jersey, you've seen Reanimator, right? Um, I've not seen the movie. I've read the story. Okay. Uh, I, I, I was, I was told that the Reanimator movie is re really disgusting. Uh, it's really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, gory and just like icky, gross, and I'm, I'm really sensitive to that. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying disgusting as in like morally reprehensible. Although, right. you know, uh, Herbert West is a creep. I think it's gory in a way that that some that a lot of '80s horror is in that it's 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 very like not realistic. So it's but anyways, if you haven't seen it, uh, then one of the main characters in that is is a young scientist who gets a room, you know, rents a room in a house and is doing his experiments. So that's how kind of Victor Frankenstein, he manages to piece together all of this, you know, dead human tissue and he creates Frankenstein now, or he creates his monster, his creature. The creature does not have a name in the book uh, other than sometimes he's called creature. He's called wretch. He's called all of these things. But at one point in the book, the creature actually suggests, given that the way he was created by someone else, that his name should be Adam. So I don't know why we don't just call him Adam Frankenstein. I think that's, <laughs> you know, that's like Joe Golem and Adam Frankenstein. Uh, so in the book, uh, I'm, I'm going to call him Adam Frankenstein. Uh, Adam is actually very intelligent and articulate. Uh, there isn't this subplot about, um, you know, sort of like a criminal or an, or an Abbey normal brain, if you've seen Young Frankenstein, uh, put into him. That's that's not present in the original plot. Uh, he's very intelligent. He's very articulate. Um, he learns. He becomes fluent in English, French, and German. Uh, he loves literature. All this kind of stuff. But his physical appearance is so different and so off-putting to everyone else that he is not accepted by anybody so in the book he is described as being eight feet tall he has yellow skin black hair and his eyes are described as being just like white and he has black straight lips his yellow skin is described as sort of barely covering the veins and tissue in in his body Something that I thought was interesting is he's actually a staunch vegetarian. He refuses to, at one point, he won't eat meat and he says something about, you know, unlike other, other men, he will not, you know, slaughter the lamb. So he just eats nuts and berries. And, you know, there's this sort of iconic scene from the movie where he is interacting with a little girl Spoiler alert for a movie that is like almost 100 years old coming up to 100 years old. Yeah. Uh, throws the girl into the into the water in the book that that scene 
is there uh, where he befriends a blind man and his family and stuff. And he is interacting with this little girl. But instead, what happens is the little girl's father sees this creature and shoots him in the shoulder. And so this sort of cements like, oh, I hate people. I hate humans. And so he spends the rest of his time looking for Dr. Frankenstein because uh, he he wants to kill him for for bringing him into the into this world as you know such a um such a beastly creature in the book he also uh he wants a mate right he wants to be loved and so he part of why he's looking for victor frankenstein is to build him a mate which he does but then dr victor frankenstein can't bear the thought of these two mating and creating a race of like hideous frankensteins so he burns the lab and burns the bride and all that kind of stuff, which just further enrages Adam Frankenstein. And really just this whole, the book is really much more about the monster, the creature kind of asking the big questions about like, why am I here? Why was I created? Why am I like this? Why does nobody love me? That kind of stuff. I thought that that was uh, pretty interesting versus the kind of, you know, fire bad. Uh, in fact, he actually uses fire in the book several times so he's not afraid of fire <laughs> but that the reason why i wanted to go next is because i see the similarities between the golem mythos and the frankenstein mythos of just sort of the human condition of being created and being here and being like well why why am i here mm -hmm. but the, the a big difference i detect though in both the movie version and in your description of the book which i haven't read is that adam frankenstein is like an ensouled being he's just different enough that he's in Congress with society and therefore that those frictions arrive and it's to tragic effect. Right. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it really has to do with his appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the golem is something that is living to the extent that it's been given the breath of life through the word of God. Right. But it's something when you, t you could take mm -hmm. that breath mm -hmm. away and it just like sort of shuts off. Like yeah, a it's machine. a little closer to that line. Yeah. But man, 19. Hmm to create that kind of story and then use that kind of story to yeah. have th this type of like transhuman or non-human creature start asking like the big questions like that. That's, that's amazing. That's something I don't think about very much. Like you hear that, right? And every time you read, mm -hmm. you, you take in that information anew. That's, it's just incredible. A uh, quick little tidbit that I found. And uh, unfortunately I don't have the guy's name, but uh, apparently Mary Shelley and her father were friends with a guy who was a very famous uh, and and very early proponent of vegetarianism, hmm. uh, which so I, I don't know if Mary Shelley was vegetarian, but she was certainly aware. And so that's that's thought to be why that element is in the book of the creature, you know, sort of being morally against eating. Hmm. Now, now y'all have seen the uh, Bernie Wrightson illustrated version of the book, right? I have seen some of the illustrations. Definitely not. Yes. I have not. Long mm. and long ago. So good. That was, I, mm. I, I highly encourage people to check it out. I remember that was where I discovered the difference between the book and the movies because I saw the drawings first. And I was like, well, well why does Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster have long hair mm. and he's walking around with no shirt and he's like super cut, but he just got like a, <laughs> like a really like, ugly face kind of thing. And it shows him like moving around the laboratory and like, like a person, you know, he's not, he's not stumbling around. Right. Um, and there was also, uh, again, I don't have the exact line, but um, in the book, he's sort of described as like all of his parts are, are described as sort of like fair and beautiful, right? Like his limbs mm. are in proportion and he's, you know, he has like beautiful teeth and a beautiful nose and beautiful cheeks and whatever, all this kind of stuff. But that when all put together, they don't, fit mm. and that's part of why he is non-traditionally handsome let's say that's th that <laughs> is such a that's such a lovely idea this idea of like having a sort of childish view of how to make something is just take all the best parts and put them together right. ignoring the fact that what's lovable about people is their faults right that weird little crookedness of their nose a little asymmetry on their body like those things are like what what like sort of gives it that extra spice and flavor it makes them utterly unique and if you made it utterly out of all perfect parts 
it would be something that we would that would like activate the uncanny valley in us. Right. It's kind of like when you see those experiments of where they do an actual like symmetrical, like if 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 someone's face was actually symmetrical and yeah. it just they don't they don't look right. <laughs> <laughs> that th- I did not know that about the character too in the book. That's great. That is such a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jersey, I think you're up. Regale us. <laughs> Regale us. Well, now, see, now going back to Ben's uh, metaphor in the beginning about showing up, you know, a little unprepared and hoping somebody else goes first. I'm listening to the two of you show up with all these literary references. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about a, a 1950s B movie character, which is totally the kind of thing I would have done in elementary school. I'm going to do my book report on a movie. <laughs> yeah, everything is fair game. I, I promise you it only worked out that way. <laughs> So um, I want to talk about The Colossus of New York, which is a 1958 Paramount Pictures movie. And uh, my connection with it started when I was, I think, like 10 years old and my parents got a VCR, which in the early 80s or mid 80s, it's, you know, it's worth noting that it was a very exciting and novel thing to be able to capture a television show and watch it again later. Right. Up to that point television was something that just happened and it went away and I did, had no guarantee of ever seeing it again. So when this VCR arrived, I was like, I am taping something off of television. And another historical uh, moment was it was uh, there was a UHF station, WSMH TV 66 playing in the tri cities area in central Michigan. And uh, they played B movies uh, on Friday nights. And so the Colossus of New York was the next movie. I'm like, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to record it. So there's that. Like, I, I found it at an early age and it was like, you know, it had a special energy around it in that regard. But I also found it to be a really haunting story about it's, it's a, a young scientist who is um, doing great strides for make, maximizing food production, solving world hunger. And he's so good at it that he wins at the beginning of the film. He's being awarded the International Peace Prize, whatever that is. And at, you know, after the ceremony, he's walking out of the building with his family and everybody's really happy. And then his little son's air, toy airplane w- rolls into the street. He goes to get it and gets hit by a car and is killed. So his father, who is heartbroken that his son is dead, but also like he, he uh, justifies his heartbreak with a great mind that the world needed was stolen from us. And what if we could preserve, you know, if it wasn't for the frailness, uh, frailness of his body, his mind could go on. And just think if we could have preserved Da Vinci and all these other great inventors from throughout history in this way. And so he builds this this artificial body, this giant Frankenstein's monster-esque body, not like the book, more like the movie, giant hulking thing, but clearly much more mechanical. Like it, it is not made of human parts. This is this is literally a synthetic body and puts his son's brain in the body. And they telegraph their punches in terms of mm. saying, but without the soul. Right. The, 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 the mind body connection is what produces or rather like uh, in souls, a creature. And if you take away the body, you've detached the mind from the soul. And without that, he's not going to be human no more. And there's also this idea of in artificial intelligence development where they're, you know, navigating these really complex problems of like, if you tell an artificial intelligence, let's say you give an, an AI, like, you know, ultimate control over the world and say like, you know, end human suffering. Well, a way to end human suffering is to kill all humans. There's no more suffering, right? So they had to be very careful to get a monkey's paw situation, right? And so that's in this story too, where this guy wakes up and he's in like this big, ugly robot body, which is upsetting. Another thing I like about it is that they really lean into like the mechanical effects. So when he talks, like when you first hear him talk, I actually have a clip. You want me to play how, how sure. he sounds when he first talks? It's creep, creepy yeah. as heck. All right. Answer me. So you can hear like it's got like when he's first learning to speak again, it's got like this heavily distorted like you're listening to like a, a, you know, AM radio transmission from across the world. You don't know what it is kind of vibe to it. So it has. Wow, that is creepy. Yeah. And uh and, and the soundtrack of the movie, too, like just talk about the movie itself. It's like it's got like this really simple single piano soundtrack. It's got like this kind of like almost like a Philip Glass kind of score to it. So it has that creepiness, too. But he 
realizes he's in the house where his family lives. His wife and son are in the house, but his father has him locked in the basement. And he's like, we're going to continue on all of your experiments to maximize food production, make the world a better place. And the son sadly agrees to it. But as time goes on, he learns to like use this big hulking body better and better. He's, he is becoming less and less detached from his humanity. He gets like a little bit more, um, more amoral in the long run. And then as he becomes more amoral, another thing emerges, he develops sort of transhuman powers. He can flash the eyes on his, you know, monster head to like hypnotize people and give them instructions. And then eventually learns how to like shoot like death rays out of his body at people. And just, and he starts to, he figures out that, Hey, I know how to maximize human, you know, or rather diminish human suffering. Let's just wipe out all people. And, but the one complication is his son finds him. And when he sees his little son, that little tiny shred of humanity is, you know, left in him, realizes what he's doing. And he asks his son to help kill him, which does happen at the end. Spoilers. But Whoa. so it's got, but it's got this idea of what I like about it is it also points to this sort of, um, I forget where I read this. Maybe it was in a Buddhist book, but this idea of like, where does the you-ness begin and end, right? If you cut off your arm, are you a little less you than you were before? Where does the you reside, yeah. right? And so it, 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 the movie, I think, even as a B, black and white, 1950s horror film, kind of touches on that idea of like you take the mind out, it's, it's somehow less than, and it, it becomes more than, it becomes transhuman, he becomes like, it, it starts getting all this extra ability through it, but at what cost? Well, he's less of a person as a result of that. So making the argument that being these frail beings that have a limited time on this earth with with a lifespan right we we have an end point and nobody gets, gets to escape that 100 percent of us are going to die as c.s lewis said you know <laughs> um that that that's actually it, it's an argument for that w would it be great to have a robot body when i was 10 i was like you betcha it'd be great to have a robot body mm -hmm. and then i saw this I was like oh maybe it's not <laughs> maybe that would kind of suck yeah yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, a, a smaller scale, but, but, but just, but the same thing where it's, it's like the, uh, it's the George Washington's axe thing, right? Where it's like, hmm. you have George Washington's axe, but after a while, you know, the handle starts to disintegrate. So you replace the handle and then, you know, oh. after a while, the, you know, it's like, at what point is it no longer George Washington's axe right, that, right. that he cut down the cherry tree with? But yeah, so it's the same thing. Like, you know, like if you were to, transplant your head onto a totally different body you know i mean i think like initially you think well yeah that would be me because it's just like putting on a different set of clothes right but mm -hmm. you know but then how much of you is all the little bits one. and things that are not, not like other people's body right like um, yeah the way yeah how much of us is the collective of all the parts all of ourselves and how much yeah. of us is yeah a little bump on your yeah toe or whatever it is yeah and and, and it's also it's not to also, get not to get off good well I, I just i just wanted to stop myself from getting all 420 about it you know it's like i know that we're not talking about anything like really earth shattering here but i i was just i was one of the reasons i like the movie is that it, it does actually tackle some interesting philosophical stuff in a silly you know sort of garish way oh that's exactly what i was going to try to that's exactly what i was going to chime in on is that, that that i always find it there's a there's an a very particular delight that comes with something like an old B movie or something like this that is is in some way plugged into or grappling with like genuine philosophical questions, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I remember that from a philosophy class asking like, like, you know, where's the you? Like if you cut off your, your finger, is that like there's no you in the finger. It's, it's a dead thing now. Right. Like, so where are you? And, and, and it, that's like, just because it's a simple question doesn't mean it's like a, it's, it's not a infinitely perplexing question. And, <laughs> and that's like, and, and for, for somebody who's like, I want to make a monster movie and I want to grapple with this weird philosophy question. That's art. Right. That's what makes art. Right. Those two mm. things push together. Yeah. So that's cool. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> this is when we usually recommend uh, a book or something. Ben, do you have a book that you want to talk about? I don't have a. I don't have a book that's terribly pertinent. I will. I can say um, that uh, after all, 
it's a little shocking to me that I have never read the Phantom Toll Booth. And my daughter, Roni, had just finished the pa- Phantom Toll Booth. <clears throat> and she was like, she's been telling me all the parts. I feel like I've read it, but she was finally like, you've got to read. So I was like, you know what? I think it's my time to read the Phantom Toll Booth. Uh, so that is the, the book that I'm starting. And I've gotten no further than the, um, I mean, this was just last night that she gave, finished it and gave it to me. But I, I got, I, I've gotten as far as the, there's a really wonderful 1996 introduction by Maurice Sendak. Um, mm. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the Phantom Toll Booth, and it was also he also waxed a little bit about the that particular time and young reader publishing uh, books for young readers that that was the '60s when there was no money and no sense of uh, uh, limits or anything like that. It was just made me really ha- right. happy and nostalgic. Yeah, so that's what I'm reading right now. Yeah, you know, I only read the Phantom Toll Booth uh, maybe like a year and a half ago for oh, okay. the first time, and I. I was I absolutely fell in love with it. I actually did like a bunch of drawings of all oh, the I remember. characters and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that yeah, yeah. that I was you are where I was like a year and a half ago. Okay. It's like I can't believe I've never read this. And then I read it and I was like, wow, that was fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Think, all right. Well, okay. Should we should we press on then? Yeah. Uh unless Jersey, you want you I, I have one that I know will make Ben. Ben's going to start talking very excitedly in a second, and it ties into our topic for the, this episode, is uh, The Original Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. Now I'm wiggling in my chair. This is not great. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's, just, it's one of my favorite books. I mean, I've read it a dozen times. It's, uh, it's way different than the Disney movie, although the Disney movie borrows you know all the, the, the big salient points from it. But... Um, you know, the probably the most intriguing line to like the general public who has never read the book is he kills Jiminy Cricket in like the first eleven pages of the book. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Pinocchio is not a good kid in the beginning. Like you watch the Disney movie, you're like, Oh, this poor little innocent kid just getting mixed up with the wrong crowd. No, he's a nasty little creep right from the start, and that's what yeah. makes his growth and his 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 uh inevitable inevitable um you know, transformation at the end that much more meaningful. Yeah. Um and, and I feel like I saw myself more in him as a child. I was like, yeah, he's just acting on all those terrible impulses that I have that I would yeah. never allow myself to, to act on. So, uh, um, and it's charmingly written. It's just, it's got like that, that, like, uh, that old kind of lilt and bounce to it that yeah. like older books have. So, and it's fun. You can just jump in. It's, it's a little episodic it also. So it's like, I like mm-hmm. when I remember it, I remember like, oh, there's there's always a part that I'm like, I forgot completely about that part. Like there's mm-hmm. a part where like, oh, yeah. I forgot when the that that farmer catches him in a trap stealing grapes and says like, well, now you can be my watchdog because my watchdog just died. It's like, <laughs> it's like, right. who, like, I always forget like, like, oh, there's a p- weird part like that, you know, it's so fun. <laughs> I've never read it and now I feel compelled to. Yeah, it's, it's well worth it's it. It's really good. Ben, uh, we're back to you now. Okay, we're back to me. Okay, this one is, I think this one, okay, one of the things that got us excited when we started talking um, was the wonderful trash heap from track from Fraggle Rock. Um, and I don't think she can really come into this episode, but I just want to say I love her so. <laughs> Marjorie. I don't, yeah, I don't want I don't want this whole episode to go by without <laughs> Me ex- at least expressing some love for the trash heap. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is a, a creature that is essentially made of trash. Um, it is a krat or krat um, mm. from Estonian folklore. Krat is a junk creature. Now, I came across this. Uh, this one, actually, I came across also from, from, from a film. Um, it's a movie called November. It's from, it's, it's also, it's an Estonian movie. It's from 2017. And um, uh, your friend and mine, Colin, and his friend Mike, they were like, Ben, have you seen this? It's, re- it's really good. And, and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, but the, the crat was the, the specifically, why, I think, why they brought it up to me. Because um, this movie, November, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a fantasy horror movie. There's a lot going on. It's black and white. It's very artsy. There's, you know, the devil at the crossroads and... Um, a, a sort of a living embodiment of the bubonic plague and uh, lots of different stuff going on. But one of the things is these creatures and the way they accomplish the creatures in the movie, I think was why the movie was brought up to me because they're kind of like these 
sort of sh- like you can the effect feels like a sort of shambling marionette puppet thing um which was just sort of when i started reading about what it was it was sort of a really really good take on this creature so it is a an automata made of hay and farm implements so like you've got and maybe like old bones so you've got some old rusty farm junk you got some hay you got some old bones you kind of put them together into a pile and then um, you go find the devil and you trade him three drops of your blood or if you're a very very clever um, farmer peasant you switch out uh, black currant berries instead of blood and in that way you get to both get this creature and keep your soul because the devil is not always smart i'm looking at pictures of these creatures okay okay the real spindly yeah. ones with the hay heads are, are i think the ones from yeah from the movie they're they're cool um and they're yeah. mostly used to like steal things or do work for the owner you know basically just do your work for you uh, the problem is, if they don't have enough work, um, they become dangerous to their owners. When you have one of these things and you, you know, there's no work for it to do and you're worried that it'll become dangerous, uh, at that point, one, thing, one solution to that problem is to give it an impossible task. Um, one of the ones suggested in what I was reading was making a ladder out of bread. Or something like this, or or some, or also just just doing something that is so time consuming that you would never ever get it done, and then it will just it'll just work itself until it catches fire and burns up, and so in some like uh, in some stories, you know, like a shooting star is a crat who has caught fire and burned away, and um, so there it is. But what's fascinating mm. to me, and and, and actually Jersey's. Uh, Jersey's monster leads into this with, with the idea of like um, artificial intelligence. Is that when you when you actually search for this online, when you write Estonian craft online, um, a lot of what you'll get, a lot of the results you'll get will be um, computer programming and AI results, articles about computer programming and AI. Because in in you know Estonian slang or parlance. Uh, a crat has become sort of a, a synonym for AI. And so there's like an artificial intelligence like law or strategy, and whatever, but, but, but there's called crot, crot law or crot's law, which is just, I just think that's, I just, I just really like how I love when something like ancient folklore finds its, its modern application, right? Like we do that with a lot of stories. Like they find their way to be, continuingly pertinent mm. to us so that's what i love about about the crot and i also just love um i, I found like it was um to me it's the closest I, uh, of mine to the, the shambling heap or the pieces of junk interestingly uh just being here in the now that i'm thinking about it, being here in this um, very old house up in the mountains in gravania i've been looking through the cantina downstairs and man, I have everything I need to build one of these guys. Like it's <laughs> it's awesome because I've been finding like all these rusty, like very very old, like <laughs> sharp edged farm implements, like like weird old like hay rakes. And um, uh, one of the things I found down there was a like a stump. Like this is how old it was. It was like a stump with an iron thing coming out of it, and the iron thing coming out of the top of the stump. And then it curves around, and I was like, what is this? It's like an iron foot pressed into, and I was like, oh, this is like, this is for making shoes. This is a, hmm. this is a big iron, like, like shoe holder so that you can cobble hmm. your own shoes. So the age of some of the farm implements down there are, are fantastic, and they've got these wonderfully curved, like, weird angled handles and stuff like this. There's an actual scythe. And I've got a lot of hay at my disposal. I'm just saying, I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not. Are you going to start hanging out at Crossroads? No, I'm not, no, I'm, I'm not going to do the thing. If I, yeah, I'm not, I'm going to do it safe, guys, is what I'm saying. I will use, <laughs> L, I will use, L, I'm going to use black currant berries. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to treat my actual <laughs> blood. But, but I might have a solution for my, I might have a solution for my next big, uh, like if I can work on another graphic novel, I know, I know who's, uh, who's drawn it. Not me. 
Get, no, it'll burn up. Mm. Get, get, do a, like a 400 page graphic <laughs> novel. It's done. It burns up. Oh, man. He's made out of uh, bicycles and yeah. <laughs> other complicated things to draw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Nice. Well, so and like the, 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 the dark, the dark, cynical side of me wonders like what you're talking about how you know you have to keep them busy or they'll yeah. revolt is sort of like what does that say about like slavery and servitude and oh, things sure, like yeah. that you know yeah marie louise von franz not to, not to like now i'm gonna get a little bit like blowhardy but uh she was a contemporary of carl jung and she advocated for the interpretation of fairy tales as representing a single psyche so it's you know, the Cinderella story is is about Cinderella, but the wicked stepmother is also a part of you. And like looking at it from the different mm -hmm. characters' perspectives is a different way of decoding what the fairy tale is about as a representation of a single mind, right? If that makes sense. And I think that's a really interesting approach to there's there's a great podcast that I love called This Jungian Life, where they they talk about this frequently. This idea of like they t they bring up a different fairy tale, like the Ash Lad story, and what does that represent? How is it similar to the Cinderella story, mm. etc. For my my second and and final automaton, I chose Talos or or Talus. Um, now Talos is from uh, Greek mythology, and I want to argue that Talos is the first uh, giant mech. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and because he, I was gonna say originally, I was gonna say that. The Talos was was the first robot, but I, I'm not sure about that. But I am confident that he's the first giant mech. Um, the earliest the earliest descriptions of him date back to about 400 uh, BCE, so he's pretty old. Uh, he doesn't have a pilot though, so he's not like Voltron or a Gundam. Mm. Um, but he is he is huge. There's there's not really a clear description as to exactly how huge he is, but he's he's pretty big. So Talos was a giant bronze. Uh, he's he's often described as an automaton, but I'm going to in a minute, I'm going to get back to that because I don't think that that's really an accurate description of him. But he is a giant bronze uh, uh, thing person uh, who was created by Hephaestus, who uh, is the the Greek god of of blacksmithing. And uh, he's created by Hephaestus um, for Zeus. So Zeus, Zeus uh, uh, commissions Hephaestus to build Talos, and then he presents Talos to the Isle of Crete to protect his uh, one of Zeus's, shall we say, flings, uh, Europa, who who lived on on Crete. And so Talos, uh, one of the things he would do is he would actually circle the island three times a day and uh he would keep intruders and anybody who didn't have you know specific invitations to visit the island he would keep them away usually by hurling boulders at their ships and things like that um something i thought that was interesting too is he was actually constructed he has one vein uh and the vein travels from his neck to his ankle and is closed off by a bronze uh nail or plug or or pin something like that. And uh, his blood is is apparently hot uh, molten lead, which some accounts say that that's what the gods had as well in, in their blood. But I, I'm I'm not I'm not confident in, in that. <laughs> so. Um, this I thought this was really interesting because like Ben, you were talking about the 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 crat and how like that's sort of been incorporated into modern speech in in Estonia. So this is a story about Talos that I thought was interesting that relates to that. So there's one there's one story that talks about how the Sardinians tried to invade Crete to capture uh, King Minos, and Talos uses fire to make himself red hot Remember, yeah he's made of bronze yeah this is where it gets to be like a horror movie <laughs> yep and he grabs the sardinians in an embrace and part of the tale says that he's smiling the whole time while uh -huh. he's, he's holding them in this embrace and this is where we get the term 
sardonic grin. Oh my god. Oh really? Oh, I yeah. that is awesome. There's a piece mm-hmm. of etymology that just tickles me. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the reason why I wanted to go back to the idea of Talos being an, an automaton and how I don't really think that's accurate is because there are several stories where he is clearly a, a, a thinking, reasoning uh, uh, being. Uh, I, I think actually that last story is, is an example. That's sort of, you know, he could have just thrown rocks or he could. But but to actually kind of come up with this plan of heating his body and then also to to have sort of a, a a wicked glee about it implies intelligence yeah um so there, there's there's a, a a tradition that also states that in addition to circling the island three times a day he would actually walk through the villages uh of crete three times a year carrying a huge tablet that had all of the island's laws and would uh, help settle disputes while uh, on his little his little walkabouts of justice. So I thought that was kind of cool. cool. I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm. Jason and the Argonauts encounter Talos, and he is throwing boulders to try to sink sink the ship. And the sorceress Medea is is on the boat, and he she is actually the one who who takes care of Talos in the mythology. Uh, in one version, she hypnotizes him, which again implies some sort of intelligence. I feel. Yeah. Um, in another, uh, she summons uh, a bunch of female death spirits that are called Kyries. Uh, and if you look them up, this might be an, uh, another one for maybe a future episode. But the Kiris, like they almost look a little bit like harpies, um, but they're they're death spirits. And so they she summons these these death spirits that attack Talos and they encircle him. And the bronze nail in his ankle gets removed, draining all of the hot lead blood out of his body and and defeating him. So. Oh, that's that's an awesome mechanical solution, though. That's cool. Yeah, and there's uh, apparently there's some dispute, but uh, some historians actually believe that this was uh, a reference to different kinds of of like mold making mm. of of having like a, a shell filled with stuff and then draining it, that kind of thing. So I thought that was interesting. So yeah, so I I enjoyed reading about Talos because I knew I knew what he was. It's like oh he's a big bronze robot, but that there's these actual like narratives with him involved and sort of his um, like I said his his intelligence uh, I found to be really really cool and interesting, and I I can't wait to try to draw him. <laughs> uh, at Crete, man. A lot of stuff happened on Crete. So like there's also, <laughs> I mean, King Minos and the Minotaur, yeah. you know, because apparently there is also another version where Talos is actually a bronze bull versus uh, a bronze person. But I think that one, I think that version is much more sort of obscure and and and, and older. And then, of course, Europa was shall we say, uh, seduced by Zeus in the form of a bull. And also, you know, Europe is named after her. So, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of bull on Crete. Oh, I was just, I just like this idea of like a lot of stuff happened on Crete. You guys ever, <laughs> we should go to Crete sometime. It's a busy place. <laughs> it's where all the action is. Good times. <laughs> 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 have you ever been have you been there oh my gosh it's like just something every day every day something's going on there <laughs> good luck getting a good night's sleep you live on crete man <laughs> so there is a- my hotel window this giant thing kept walking by it three times a day. throwing rocks at everybody <laughs> or settling disputes you could never tell is it gonna be next and, and careful, oh, careful, everybody. He's a hugger. Uh, there's, there's a great <laughs> book. <laughs> there's, <So terrible. laughs> he's a hugger. There's, there's a great <laughs> audio book called Gods and Robots, Myths, Machines, and Ancient Dreams of Technology by uh, Adrienne Mayer. And she goes into this and even talks about like how 
the name Talos has been, it's been carried not just like with the myth, but like it's been applied to a lot of technological things today. Like there are Talos missiles, which are like a, sort of an automated defense missile system that the United States military Ooh, created. Sweet, yeah. Yeah, in in searching for Talos, I also came across a lot of um, things like that, and and programming languages, and 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 things yeah. like that. Um, I think I may have come across that book as well. Uh, does she talk about sort of the encounter with Medea yes. and sort of this like yeah. sorcery versus technology? And, and yeah, and this is back in four hundred. Yeah, yeah, and I think she even cites one iteration on that confrontation where Medea actually tempts him with the notion of becoming human. Um, I, I, it's been, it's been a year since I listened to the book, but, uh, but yeah, it, I, I remember very clearly that, that the confrontation ends with the plug being pulled and all the liquid in his body, which she calls it I core, which I guess is like some kind of, and she says it's the same thing that runs through Zeus's veins, but she never describes like what it actually yeah. is, but yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. I think, I think my understanding is that Iker is just it, it's it's kind of like a I don't know it's like a it's like a medieval humor kind of thing mm. like it's not really uh it's not necessarily a real right liquid anymore but it's some sort of it's a, it's something yeah. we don't want in our veins that's for sure no probably not All right. Well, uh, I'm going to redeem myself by actually referring to uh, a book. Well, short stories, um, and acknowledging that you know the author is problematic. It's uh, Lovecraft. You know, he was he had all sorts of problems, but he is undoubtedly a very influential horror writer. And I had recently just started reading his short stories, or rather, audiobook of his short stories, if that makes a difference. And I finally listened to the series of Reanimator stories which is Herbert West, the reanimator. We talked about him a moment ago. Now, Zach, you've seen the movie. Um, is the movie done with like kind of a humorous vibe to it? I would say so, yeah. Because I've heard that from other people, that this, the, this story is supposed to be funny, but I found it really upsetting. <laughs> 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 like, maybe I'm too sensitive, but like I was not laughing when I was reading the reanimator. I mean, one, there was like I mean, the it's rampant. not like a knee slapper, but it's definitely, uh, yeah, I would say uh, the movie definitely attempts to not take itself super seriously but okay. yeah so i mean and the thing i've i've i in observe about lovecraft's writing having read a little bit of his stuff is he seems to be more about like not showing things it's like what he doesn't show that makes it so creepy you know, yeah. like there's like the story of a guy walking across like this dried ocean bed and he finds this idol and it's it's the anticipation of seeing something and then like a fish monster jumps up and then jumps down. That's all you get. <laughs> it's like that's the scariness is like he sees a fish monster for like a few seconds and then it's gone, you know, um, and, so and these stories the mood. That's what's so awesome. Yeah, it's very much about mood and it's less about like, you know, it's it's the the narrator's interpretation of what he saw and you don't really right. get like a yeah, clear picture of it. So which I appreciate as somebody who likes horror films where you don't see the monster, right? Like I, the mm -hmm. example I think of every time is the movie Super 8 where it's like that monster is so scary until they show it. And it's like, okay, it's a big, you know, monster eating people. We've seen yeah. this before. Yeah. So. Agreed. Anyway. Anyway, so the reanimator is, it takes place, uh, let's see, it was serialized in, I want to say the 20s? I want to say like 19, uh, 22, I think is what it, it, I read. And uh, so there's six sort of short stories that are all connected to one another. And he ref with each new chapter, he refers to the previous ones. And it takes place uh, roughly the turn of the century through the First World War. And it's about this, the narrator is this, this um, medical student who befriends this guy named Herbert West, who is, he's, he has, he's working on this formula. It's like a, because back then it's always like a, an elixir, right? <laughs> it's a formula that, that will re he's working on an idea to extend life by reanimating the dead. And there's a lot of the idea around Herbert West's um, assumption is that it's about freshness. Getting the body as fresh as possible is the key. You can't just go find like a, you know, a half desiccated corpse and give it the injection it springs up. It has to be someone who died just like seconds ago. And so a lot of, I guess, the quote unquote humor is around this guy, like really sort of um, scientifically and like amorally looking for opportunities to acquire fresh corpses, right? Without, mm -hmm. without getting caught. And um, 
And he, he winds up making a series of different reanimations. And the first one is, I mean, this is like what I was just talking about Lovecraft, about not saying very much is like they get a body. They're working on this table in like this little farmhouse. They give it the injection and it's like, oh, he's not coming back to life. So they go into the other room and they hear this hellish scream that is so frightening. They jump out of the window and then the building burns down. And the, so you don't even see what it is, just the scream, right? And then the second one is this creature that is the they get the corpse of this local medical hero during a typhoid outbreak. He he dies from exhaustion from helping all these people with typhoid. So they 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 literally they they do a weekend at Bernie's and drag him up to their hotel room <laughs> and they tell like the 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 you know the keeper of the hotel like oh look we're just having a wild night and they take the corpse into his bedroom and then like shoot him up and he comes to life nearly kills both of them and becomes this weird, you know, animal cannibal monster. And so some people say like, oh, this is the first zombie story because it's an undead creature that actually mm. eats human flesh. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. creepy enough, they, 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 they catch him and they just put him in an asylum. So he's like still alive as the story continues. Uh, but then it gets... One of the themes that's sort of like I interpret throughout it is very similar to the Colossus of New York is that like when you interrupt the natural cycle of things, and this is the tension between science and nature, right? Science is always trying to find a way to exploit and optimize nature. That's one way of saying it, I guess. Um, but if you are doing it in a sort of narrow or myopic way, and you're not really thinking <coughs> holistically about this, na the, the, the results will always be somehow catastrophic or unpleasant or unwelcome right and so one of the ideas that keeps coming up is like he wakes up some of these people and like they just wake up with a terrified scream and then fall back dead or one of the one of the people wakes up and they're like screaming at west keep that needle away from me and then he dies again right but the, the most gruesome one is at the very end where they're in world war one they're working as field medics and a celebrated officer who actually knows about Herbert West's experiments gets nearly decapitated in an accident. So Herbert West coolly just finishes the job, takes off the head and tries to reanimate the body is successful. The body sort of springs to life, but then he hears a scream from the back of the room, you know, and it's, it's clearly the head of the man's body screaming. And then the, the final chapter is where it gets really unpleasant is suddenly this, this man shows up at the, institution where the first, the cannibal character is being held and the thing that they say is he's very tall and his face doesn't move his he's got like this very beautiful head but his head doesn't move and it almost feels like he's talking through ventriloquism and they demand to have the cannibal body you know or the cannibal creature uh released and when the institution doesn't let him this this weird man with this weird wax like face and all these other monsters assault the institution and free the cannibal monster and they all descend on Herbert West's house and our narrator watches them show up and tear Herbert West apart. Obviously the man with the wax head is the headless body from the previous story. So, uh, and then they drag the body away through this cavern that's underneath the house that they're living in. So it's, it's got like a lot of like really creepy, gruesome suggestions in it. There's a lot of disgusting stuff like implied in it. And it, what I received from reading the story is that Herbert West is thinking so, what would you say, materially, right? And he's not, yeah. he's, he's, he, he, this is what happens when you are like, this is an, an outcome if you subscribe to all on atheism and materialism. There is no soul, so why even worry about it? Well, then why are these people so terrified to come back from wherever they were? Right. He was and so why, busy wondering if he could, he didn't stop to think if he should. He should. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that this is like my favorite animated uh, material monster, but it was, uh, you know, it, 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 it was an interesting, it, it, especially that it came around like so early. It was like the 1920s, you know, like that, that we would have this interpretation of the Frankenstein monster story. Um, I don't know. I, I, I found it intriguing and I found it like vaguely haunting. Um, but, and I, yeah, and it's certainly, I've never heard of it before. Yeah. 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 It, when you, when you read that last chapter, it's called uh, the tomb legions. I, I mean, I, I recommend you read them all if you're at all interested. Uh, I will warn you there is some, because it's Lovecraft, there is some like flagrant rampant racism in there. <laughs> there are some descriptions that I was like, yikes. Oh my gosh. Even in 1920, that was gross to say, yeah. but, um, yeah, <laughs> 
But for, yeah, I, for... I, I've said that, you know, I, I, um, I live in Massachusetts, which is very close to Providence, Rhode Island. And for years, I wondered why Providence didn't do more about uh, sort of having more H.P. Lovecraft stuff because he was from there and a lot of his stories take place there. And then I started to learn about H.P. Lovecraft and I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. 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 They, they have since started. Um, they have since started pointing out more uh, about H.P. Lovecraft. But yeah, H.P. Lovecraft, for those who don't know, he was absolutely racist and not in a way of like, well, everyone in 1920 was racist. Like he was racist by 1920 standards. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he like he he talks about Italian immigrants in these stories in a way that's like, oh, come now. Yeah. So, yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but yeah. So, OK, quick question. So the guy with the wax head, does the wax head have like features? Like I'm sort of imagining like like what are you imagining? I want to see what you picture in your head when you hear that description. I mean, I, I would like to see it as just like the most vague of of human visages in wax, mm. right? And also just thinking mm. about how wax is not a terribly uh, uh, solid material. So, you know, like, I don't know, maybe it's like melting or something. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I was imagining something like you'd stole like like a head stolen from a wax museum where it, somebody tried to make it pretty convincing, mm, yeah. but maybe it's under a wide brimmed hat and the body's clearly moving, which makes the non movement of the head that much stranger. Yeah, yeah. the The way they describe it in the book is that like it's clearly it's a wax face. It's a very beautiful wax face, but they assume that it's to hide a horrible disfigurement from World War One. Right. Something right. They, like something terrible happened to this poor man's face. And so he wears this wax mask. But but like, you know, in an instant, like, nope, that's the the military. It's wax officer. all the way through. Oh. Yeah, it's a, it's an entirely wax head. And yeah. So, yeah, in the end, all of Herbert West's reanimations come back and are under the command of the headless creature who then, you know, gets the, the last monster who's in the asylum and they all descend upon Herbert West's house and and like. The, the story describes like this is the first time you ever see emotion on Herbert West's face is as they tear his head from his body and then drag him off, drag his remains through the wall into the catacombs underneath this house. All right. Well, so that was <laughs> our <laughs> exactly on that cheerful note, on that cheerful note. <laughs> well, no, that was our constructs episode and that was really cool. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I'm trying to think like uh, what we were talking about before about sort of, uh, how all of these creatures seem to have some sort of betrayal or perceived betrayal uh, to their human creators or masters. It seems like mm. um, possibly with the exception of Talos, he's the only one that seems like, uh, you know, I don't know, like Jersey, you were saying if, if Medea uh, sort of tempted him with being human, you know, maybe there is a, a, a further storyline there. Mm. Um something like that yeah i don't know well okay so uh what we do on this show is afterwards we do a wrap-up and we each choose our favorite from what the others uh presented so mm. let's see so ben you had the uh the golem and the crat mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. jersey you had the colossus yep and the i don't know what would you call them just the <laughs> The, the Herbert West reanimations. Yeah, the reanimations. And then uh, I had the Adam Frankenstein and uh, Talos. So, Jersey, as our guest, why don't you go first? I pick my favorite that I heard about today? Yeah. Uh, well, it'd have to be Talos. I, when I saw that you were going to talk about Talos, I was like, oh, I wanted to talk about Talos. <laughs> 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 I think, I think, yeah, he is a really cool, I like what I read where, when I was heard of the book that he could like make his chest, like a furnace hot and he just hugs dudes to death. I was like, that is a scary monster. <laughs> yeah. You know, I almost imagined him as kind of like an iron giant. Uh, yeah. Esque. All right, Ben, do you want to go next? Uh, my favorite was Jersey's Colossus of New York. Uh, partially mm. just because of the story, the way he told the story of both the, the, the story of it and the story of coming to the story, how he came to the story. Mm -hmm. And also um, 
but it like made a whole bunch of thematic sense, but then it also had those weird B movie touches that it suddenly develops like laser eyes. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is just like, oh, and by the way, it develops late hypnotizing laser eyes. Uh, which is just <laughs> such a non sequitur from the rest of it that I was like, I and I would. It's also something I would never had any inkling existed at all. So I, mm. I, I learned about a whole brand new thing. So that's has my, that ever been on Sven Gulli? It should. It really should, but it hasn't been. I don't know if it's a rights thing. I mean, it is a Paramount picture. So thanks. All right, Zach. Um. Well, uh, this is going to sound like I'm keeping it even, but. So be it. Uh, I think my favorite was actually the Krat. Like I want to, I want to see that movie. Um, but yeah. I love the idea that it's like a very, almost like a practical, I, I like the ruralness of it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like it's not a creature created in a lab by a brilliant scientific mind um, or by a God in Talus's uh, case. Um, it's just a very like, Oh, you need help around the farm? Well, you know, throw some hay and trowels together and go contact the devil and you got you got yourself a farm hand. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that that was going to be your favorite sack <laughs> for those reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also but I love the I love the sort of fairy tale aspect of it too and the idea of like, you know, yeah. keep it it's got to stay busy and you got to give it sort of an impossible task. So that it doesn't yeah. start getting ideas. It's got some old fairy tale book feel to it. Yeah, definitely. Ben, can we have Jersey on every episode? <laughs> <laughs> we can have Jersey on as many episodes as he would like to participate in. This is a ton of fun. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, Jersey, because you always you always bring a clarity and an insight to to this kind of stuff that uh, I've always been uh, in admiration of. So oh. thank you so much for participating in this episode and yeah, thank uh, you for letting me talk about monsters with you i mean that, that felt like us like sitting underneath the sheet and you know whispering about our favorite monsters before mom and dad come in and tell us additional lights out yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely well okay so jersey why don't you tell people where to find you oh i hope everybody listening if you thought that i had anything to add to this conversation if you didn't you don't have to go here but if you did uh, BaronVonBear.com is my middle grade graphic novel. It's a, a middle grade spooky adventure story. It's got ghosts and monsters and all sorts of things like the stuff we're talking about today. There's a creature called the Living Doll, which is a haunted doll oh, sort man. of Annabelle thing. There's a, a thing called the the Severed Head of Lobo, which is a, 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 a an object that creates werewolves. So it's like all of the kind of things we're talking about today are in this book. It comes out in 2023 from Iron Circus Comics, but you can go and get on the list to find out when it's going to be up for pre-order at BaronVonBear.com. Thank you, Zach. It's like he's done this before. <laughs> Fantastic. No, I, I like that. Also, it's, well, but Jersey, you buried the lead, too, that your main character is a bear wizard. Oh, that's he's right. Like, yes. Yeah. It's he's, like if he's, Winnie the Pooh and Doctor Strange got together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that was one of the pitch lines for it. it was like, what if you did Doctor Strange with Hello Kitty? And uh, and he's the guy who you take your cursed objects to. So you're Percy, he's got the Medusa head, you stop the Kraken, what do you do with the Medusa head? What do you put it in the closet? What if your son finds it? You take this thing to Baron Von Baer, he keeps it safe. And then, of course, if you have a house full of all these powerful cursed objects, somebody's going to come after it, a villain does, all the objects get released into the world, he goes in quest to try to find them. And when he finds them in, you know, out in the world, he discovers that they are not, they are not what he thought they were. So there's the, you know, the real, you know, movie trailer line. Yeah. In a world. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, that was, uh, again, that was our Constructs episode. Uh, thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. Uh, and for Ben Hackey, I'm Zach Giolongo. And for Zach Giolongo, I remain Ben Hackey. You didn't, you didn't give your middle name this time. Benjamin Margaret, sorry. Sorry, gotta <laughs> gotta put it in the home. No, Jersey, he's been doing that on his own. He's been saying his name is Benjamin Margaret Hackey, so Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it has stuck for permanent. It's great. <laughs> the more syllables you can add, the better. Till next time, and um Jersey, we definitely want to have you back. So hopefully oh, we thanks. Can make that happen. Thank you all and good night. Bye. All right. Bye everybody. Hey everyone, David Universe here, producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. 
On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there.